us peace in this troubled day when hearts are fearful we find new faith help us to trust in your firm control peace is our prayer true peace our goal. Put hearts of rulers firm in your hand to turn and guide at your sure command. God lead paths of right and let the nations serve your light oh please grant to us peace in our time peace in our And now we cast all our cares upon you, knowing your promise is true. A day come when swords shall be laid down. The Prince of Peace will wear the only crown. All souls oppressed will find release. Then war and hate, discord and Conflict, strife and injustice forever and ever, forever will melt into With times as they are, I thought about the Belhar Confession. Why the Belhar Confession? This is the newest confession in the Book of Confessions. So let me read what the book says about its latest edition. The Confession of Belhar was written as a protest against the heretical theological stance by the white Dutch Reformed Church that used the Bible and the Confessions to justify the harsh and unjust system of apartheid. After centuries of emotional, physical, and psychological abuse, unfair and unjust practices, and horrific violations of human rights, apartheid is the impetus for the Confession of Belhar. It is never mentioned in the actual confession. The confession takes a proactive approach in its language. It lifts the heart of the gospel as a bringer of hope for the human condition. Belhar presents a Christian view of racism, 
separation, and suffering by those who had experienced the realities of these evils. It demonstrates that confessional affirmations can arise from social ethics. Bilhar has three points, three central points, reconciliation, unity, and justice. Finally, the confession of Belhar embraces the central notion, Jesus is Lord. With this confession, Belhar confirms that only Jesus Christ may lord over us and over our church. This confession was actually created in the 1980s, but the PCUSA's 222nd General Assembly passed it in 2016. Why? Well, it took a special committee for a committee of committees. We love committees in the Presbyterian Church. This particular special committee on the Confessions of Belhar was established to address issues and concerns. In the end, it recommended approval because the Confessions witness to unity, reconciliation, and justice might help the denomination in its efforts to address division and racism. One of the primary authors of the Belhar Confession, Russell Butman, commented, the significant contribution that Belhar adds in complementing the existing standards is the explicit confession of faith in the God of justice. The confession of Belhar closes a loophole in reformed confessions by coming to terms with the revelation of God about the realities of social justice. God is, in a special way, revealed as the God of those who suffer, especially those who suffer because of poverty and injustices. So why should we care about this confession? The introduction to this says, difficult as it is to find the way between church and authority without personal freedom, or without personal freedom of the church's authority, a distinctive mark of the Reformed tradition is the belief that it is only by seeking this difficult way that the church can be a united community of Christians who are both Reformed and always reforming. We are only too aware that this confession calls for the dismantling of structures of thought of church and of society which have developed over many years and has harmed and marginalized oppressed people. Accordingly, our prayer is that the pain and sadness that we speak of will be the pain and sadness that leads to salvation. We believe that this is possible in the power of our Lord and by his spirit. We believe that the gospel of Jesus Christ offers hope liberation, salvation, and true peace to our country. This confession must be a call to a continuous process, a soul searching together, a joint wrestling with the issues and a readiness to repent in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in a broken world. We make this confession not as a contribution to a theological debate, but as a cry from the heart as something we are obliged to do for the sake of the gospel in view of the times in which we stand. Along with many, we confess our guilt and that we may not have always witnessed clearly enough in our situation and are so jointly responsible for a way for those things that are happening now. Part of the Convention states, we reject any doctrine which, in such a situation, sanctions the name of the gospel or the will of God the forced separation of people on the grounds of race and color, and thereby in advance constructs that weakens the ministry and the experience of reconciliation in Christ. We believe the prophet Isaiah, that God has revealed God's self as the one who wishes to bring about justice and true peace among people. Luke 6, that God in a world full of injustice is in a special way the God of the destitute, the poor, and the wronged. Luke 4, that God calls the church to follow in, God in this way, for God brings justice to the oppressed and gives bread to the hungry. That God frees the prisoner and restores sight to the blind. Psalm 146, that God supports the downtrodden, protects the stranger, helps orphans and widows, and blocks the path of the ungodly. From James, the first chapter, that for God, pure, undefiled religion is to visit the orphans and the widows in their suffering. Micah 6, 8, that God wishes to teach the church to do what is good and to seek the right. From Amos, that the church must therefore stand by people in any form of suffering and need, which implies, among other things, 
that the church must witness against and strive against any form of injustice so that justice may roll down the waters and righteousness like an ever flowing stream. Psalm 82, that the church as the possession of God must stand where the Lord stands, namely against injustice and with the wronged. Leviticus 19, that in following Christ, the church must witness against all the powerful and privileged who selfishly seek their own interests and thus control and harm others. Therefore, we reject any ideology which will legitimate the forms of injustice and any doctrine which is unwilling to resist such an ideology in the name of the gospel. We believe that in obedience to Jesus Christ, its only head, the church is called to confess and to do all these things, even though authorities and human laws might forbid them, and punishment and suffering may be the consequence. Jesus is Lord. To the one and only God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be the honor and the glory forever and ever. I think this is really powerful, and I spent a lot of time crying in the last few weeks. Black people have been crying out for racial injustice over, for over 400 years, but I've learned a lot in these last two weeks as well. There, are, there have been changes already just this week, just in the last two days, in terms of procedures that police can use. There have been changes in how people have started to work together from all walks of life. I participated in a Zoom call last night um, with the, the rear committee from uh, the ELCA on what they're doing to address their concerns regarding racism. For the first time in a long time, North Omaha churches have been working together to help deal with the COVID crisis. That doesn't happen very often because some of the churches are very territorial and they want to do their own thing. But this time, everybody worked together. We discovered not too long ago that elderly residents in the home, Omaha Housing Authority towers were being neglected. So the churches got together, adopted the towers, and provided food, non-perishable food and supplies for those residents. Many churches started pantries that had never done anything like that before and not only for their members, but for the community in which they reside. That was, that was new, that was different. Working together. But then there are times that I become discouraged and I worry. And then I think, God, what do you want us to do? So then I remember all power in heaven and earth is given to Jesus Christ by the almighty God who raised Christ from the dead and set him above rule and authority all power and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. God has put all things under the lordship of Jesus Christ and has made Christ head of the church, which is his body. Christ calls the church into being, giving it all that is necessary for its mission to the world, for its building up, and for its service to God. Christ is present with the church in both spirit and word, it belongs to Christ alone to rule, to teach, to call, and to use the church as he wills, exercising his authority by the ministry of women and men for the establishment and the extensions of his kingdom. Christ gives to his church its faith and life, its unity and mission. Insofar as Christ's will for the church is set forth in scripture, it is to be obeyed in affirming with the earliest Christians that Jesus is Lord the church confesses that he is its hope and that the church as Christ's body is bound to this authority and thus free to live in the lively, joyous reality of the grace of God. I love that statement. Wish I wrote it, but I didn't. I took it out of the, um, the introduction to the Book of Order. The last time it was in there, I believe, was 2011. They come up with some new stuff now. But I just think, think that is just amazing. But God has called each of us to spread the good news. God has called us to take care of the poor, the oppressed people that have long been silenced. God has called us to care for the captives, the prisoners, the hurt, the dying. In Micah 6, 8, we hear our charge. What does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God? In Luke 6, verses 20 to 20, 26, this is the message version. Then he spoke, you are blessed when you have lost it all. 
God's kingdom is there for the finding. You were blessed when you were ravenously hungry. Then you were ready for the messianic meal. You are blessed when the tears flow freely. Joy comes with the morning. Count yourself blessed every time someone cuts you down or throws you out. Every time someone smears your name or tries to discredit me. What it means is that the truth is too close for comfort and that the person is uncomfortable. But it is trouble ahead if you think that you have made it, if you have it made. What you have is all you'll ever get. And it is trouble ahead if you are satisfied with yourself. Yourself will not satisfy you for long. And it is trouble ahead if you think that life's all fun and games. There's suffering to be met, and you're going to meet it. There's trouble ahead when you live only for the approval of others, seeing what flatters them, doing what indulges them. Popularity contests are not truth contests. Look at how many scoundrel creatures were approved by our ancestors. The task is true, but not popular. God has called on each of us to bring about change in our own ways. I had a friend that was fond of saying, change is good, you go first. We can't look to others to do what we need to do. We know what's right. We know what our strengths are, and most of us know how to call for help if we need to do so. Again, God has called on each of us to bring about that change that we need to see fit in our world today. It won't be easy. We will be taken from our comfort zones to help make God's kingdom here on earth a better place for all. But that's what Christianity is about. Think of what Jesus did in three years. And we've had a whole lifetime to do that. We see the suffering. We can see where we need to help but we can't do it alone. We're all in this together. We will be taken from our comfort zones, but we're called to change because that's what we do. Let us pray. Merciful God, we praise you that you give strength for every weakness and forgiveness for our self failures and new beginnings in Jesus Christ. Especially, we think and thank you for your guidance of your spirit through this day. Signs of new life and hope, people who have helped us, those who struggle for justice, expressions of love unexpected or undeserved. Almighty God, you know all needs before we speak our prayers yet you welcome us in our concerns for others in Jesus Christ. Especially, we pray for those who keep watch over the sick and the dying, those who weep with the grieving, those who are without faith and cannot accept your love, the elderly who are lonely, distressed, or weak, those who are reformed, the Presbyterians and the ELCA. Great God, you are one God, and you bring together what is scattered, and you mend what is broken. You're teaching us not to fear change, but to accept it and work with it. Unite us with the scattered peoples of the earth, that, may be, that we may be one family of your children. Bind up all our wounds and heal us in spirit that we may be renewed as disciples of Jesus Christ, our master and our savior, who taught us to pray saying, our father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. May the grace and peace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen. <laughs>